Remind mm. us what the mechanism is by which creatine can have this effect on muscle mass and strength. Yes, so it's very multifactorial and it's a little bit different than protein. A lot of people think they go hand in hand, but there's a bit of difference. So a lot of uh, people who have tried creatine say, hey, they might have experienced a little bit of weight gain or maybe a little bit of bloating during the initial stages. And creatine is osmotic. So when it comes, when it leaves your small intestine and enters the blood, it likes to drag water into your muscle. And so the principle of osmosis will be when a solute is going into an area, water will maintain equilibrium. So you're going to have a little bit of water coming in. And by swelling the cell, or let's in this case muscle, that seems to turn on a whole bunch of beneficial things within the cell or the, under the, the sarcolemma. Um, your viewers may have heard of things called transcription factors or satellite cells or insulin-like growth factor one. They all seem to get increased in the presence of creatine when the cell is swollen. It has some ability to turn on proteins in the mTOR pathway. Um, and it has it actually has been shown to increase calcium and glycogen uh, kinetics. So when you put all those things together, it, sub, it basically helps them uh, create an anabolic environment for muscle growth. I should be clear, it's never been shown to increase the rates of protein synthesis directly. So unlike whey protein or other protein which has, a creatine sort of works other ways. It may allow the muscle cell to just have a greater capacity to do more work or respond. But it also has been shown to decrease muscle protein catabolism. So it may maintain the integrity of the cell a little bit more. Um, and again, primarily in rodents or those long duration aerobic exercise, it may have the ability to decrease inflammation. And we know inflammation is a main precursor for muscle protein breakdown or oxidative stress. So there's probably about 10 purported mechanisms how it works, uh, but cell swelling seems to be something that needs to be there to turn on all these processes. You mentioned there that creatine might help the muscles do more work. The idea being there that if you do greater volume, rep sets uh, and or load that you get greater adaptations from your training? Yeah, that's kind of the subjective way that we uh, uh, we theorize it works. We've shown uh, in older adults, especially that uh, creatine can increase training volume, which is actually correlated with per performance. But there's been many studies that have shown that creatine did not have a difference compared to placebo in training volume, yet it still uh, led to improvements. So not necessarily always dictated by training volume, there seems to be some cellular reasons why creatine could at least increase the size and or strength of the muscle. What happens if someone supplements with creatine but doesn't do resistance training? Does their strength or, or muscle size change? We only see an increase in uh, body water retention and or uh, some minimal benefits on muscle or neuromuscular function. That's primarily ever been shown in older populations. Uh, if there are a few studies in younger populations, I'm not really that uh, uh, aware. Um, it seems like create or sorry, exercise, primarily resistance training or weight training, needs to be there to create the stimulus for these processes to occur. With regards to the the dose, you know, before we spoke about three to, to five grams per day, it might be a little bit more if if you're you know considered elderly. Should we be thinking about creatine supplementation in terms of a, a fixed amount in grams like this for everyone, or should it be grams per kilogram of lean mass so that that dose is a bit more specific to how much muscle they have? Yes, yeah, so this is a very good question and interesting. So the absolute usually is based on the convenience of just saying, hey, I'm going to take three to five grams or a half a teaspoon or the loading phase, which a lot of athletes will adopt because they really need a, a quick rapid boost. That's like 20 grams a day for five to seven days. But there was a paper published in 2003 by Adam Persky, and I think it's one of the best reviews ever done on creatine. And he made the case that the larger you are, you're going to probably have more creatine transport kinetics turned on. It's very similar to maybe protein. If you're 100 kilograms versus 50, 
maybe you're going to need more. And he made the good case that, uh, or theorized that the larger you are, you may have more muscle mass. And if you have more muscle mass, you may have more of these cre uh, creatine doorways that allow creatine in. It's very similar to GLUT4 with glucose. So we've been uh, toying with this idea ever since we started to base it on relative size. We get people to come into the lab, they go on a scale, and if they're 70 kilograms, they get seven grams a day. If they're 50 kilograms, they get five. And uh, we've shown that dose to be very effective resulting in no adverse effects. Um, so I think it's it's kind of just taking the idea of maybe the person who's an offensive lineman in the NFL or Aussie rules football, whatever, they might need more compared to someone who's a child, for example. So that's kind of why we did it. Um, and um, But there's two viable ways. It looks like you can go either way, an absolute or a, a relative dose. Mm -hmm. I'm at the stage now where I kind of know my size and I take a higher dose, just easy, um, easily measured twice a day. Yeah. And that relative dose though, that, that you've used in your studies, actually I've seen you've, you've used a, a few different doses, but uh, one of them is 0.1 grams per kilogram per day. Yeah. 99% of our studies use the 0.1. And then the only study in the longest trial in postmenopausal women, we thought about anabolic resistance, we ate 0.15 which was about 11 grams of monohydrate a day.